Judy, Judy Collins and Pete Seeger covering Woody Guthrie's song, Union Made. And soon, Pete Seeger will be celebrating his 90th birthday with a huge event at Madison Square Garden with Bruce Springsteen and others. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're on the road in Washington, D.C. The current financial crisis is widely described as the nation's worst since the Great Depression. With the comparisons to the 1930s has come a renewed focus on the New Deal, the government initiative of social programs and public service jobs launched by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Advocates for a just and sustainable economic recovery hope its legacy can be revived. The New Deal came out of immense public pressure and a White House inner circle that helped turn popular demands into policy. A new book argues no voice in the FDR administration was more influential in shaping the New Deal than the Labor Secretary, Frances Perkins, the first ever woman cabinet member in the United States. The book is called The Woman Behind the New Deal, The Life of Frances Perkins, FDR Secretary of Labor and His Moral Conscience. Author Kirsten Downey joins me now here in Washington, D.C. She was a staff writer for The Washington Post for 20 years and, in 2008, shared a Pulitzer Prize for the Post coverage of the Virginia Tech shootings. We welcome you to Democracy Now! Thank Talk you. about the significance, Kirsten, of Frances Perkins, how the role she played in laying down the New Deal, the program she was instrumental in getting passed. Well, I think the really interesting thing about Frances Perkins is that she was a rather reluctant um, cabinet secretary. She was very worried about what her life would be like in Washington um, if she were to join FDR here. She had been his industrial commissioner for four years in New York. They were already close friends. Um, in exchange for agreeing to take the job, she gave him pretty much a list of demands of what she would insist on happening if she were to become secretary of labor. And they are the things that we consider the New Deal now. They're 40-hour work week, uh, workers' compensation as a national program, uh, unemployment compensation, uh, social security, a ban on child labor, and uh, national health insurance. I want to turn to a clip of Frances Perkins speaking about the Social Security Act of 1935, known as one of her greatest achievements. In 1960, 25 years after its passage, Perkins reflected on how Social Security came about. We were not yet out of the woods of the Great Depression. And, of course, it was the Great Depression, which we must never forget in this country, which was the proximate cause of this movement, which was launched at that time this movement to write under the, under the lives of the American people a basis of security which came to them out of the orderly and, and substantial and regular co contributions to their future and to the future hazards. It would not have been done in that year, I am sure, except for the fact that the Great Depression was still faring us in the face, and we were conscious of it whenever we walked on the streets of Washington. Frances Perkins talking in 1960 about the act that had been passed 25 years before, uh, in 1935, the Social Security Act. Talk about, actually, how it happened. I think especially for people involved in social movements, uh, Kirsten Downey, to understand the mechanism of change, how Social Security was passed. Uh, I think that one of the things that we sort of need to, to put in context here is that the Great Depression wasn't the first economic cataclysm that people who were in their 50s and 60s had experienced. Um, it was the fourth. If, uh, you know, we had a very bad downturn in 1893, a bad one in 1907. Things had been very bad in the early 1920s, after the First World War. People saw that part of capitalism was a recurring boom and bust cycle. Um, what they were seeking to do with Social Security was to create a shock absorber system for capitalism that would give people, that would give people a, a grace period to survive, or if they got to the end of their lives and um, their investments hadn't turned out the way they thought, despite a lifetime of working, that there'd be a safety net for you. Um, the unemployment insurance and Social Security, in particular, were came out of that understanding um, that there that we will have boom times, we will have bust times. Um, during the boom times, we will prosper, capitalism will recover, but we need a way to help human beings get through if they hit a bust at a time that they can't deal with it anymore.
Aren't we seeing the same struggles today? I mean, you had Hoover. You had the Hoovervilles all over the country. He was saying that the economy was going to be okay. Then you have FDR. He himself may not have come up with these plans without uh, that inner circle of people like Henry Wallace and Francis Perkins and the New York social worker Harry Hopkins. Uh, but those who were saying you needed the government to help, but the others who were saying you don't have the government intervene, that's socialism. Uh, there was that feeling and always a concern, but the Great Depression was such a devastating event. Um, I think a lot of people forget how afraid business became um, during this period. Um, uh, observers in Europe said that American capitalists lost completely lost self-confidence. The, the things they had done had, had, in many cases, led to economic disaster. Um, and so there was a, a great sense that a new, new, new system needed to be established. Um, and uh, later, once, uh, once uh, business began to recover somewhat, um, there was a, a resistance later to uh, some, of the, uh, some of the New Deal programs. And in fact, you know, uh, Roosevelt and his allies dropped some of the early things they had done, essentially dropped, like, the National Industrial Recovery Act. Um, but early on, there was a, a, a great uh, awareness that something dramatic had to happen. Uh, it's notable that in the early uh, months of the Roosevelt administration, when he went to the Chamber of Commerce, he received a standing ovation. Hmm. Last week marked the 98th anniversary of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire, right. which had a huge influence on Francis Perkins. On March 25, 1911, nearly 150 garment workers, mostly women, died after a fire broke out at the Triangle Factory in New York. I wanted to turn to a radio piece I produced in 1986, along with Kathy Doby, to mark what was then the fire's 75th anniversary. I worked right near where the fire was. There was cutters there. They were cutting the material. And as soon as they were just going out, it was time to go home. It was 4 o'clock on Saturday. Pauline Pepe is a 94-year-old survivor of the Triangle Fire. I saw the fire in the tables where they were all filled with lingerie material, you know, and that come up in a flame. When I saw that, I ran out. I went to the door that was closed. I didn't know that was closed. I went there and I found the door closed. I just stood there till they opened it. Forty people going down the steps. We all tumbled one right after another. And I saw people throwing themselves from the window. And as soon as we went down, we couldn't get out because the bodies were coming down. It was terrible. The women that died that late afternoon were young Jewish and Italian immigrants. When the fire broke out, they tried to escape down the stairs, but found the doors had been locked. The owners believed that given the chance, workers would sneak out with stolen material and union organizers would sneak in. Some of the women climbed onto the single fire escape. It collapsed. As onlookers watched, women fell nine stories to the sidewalk below. Inside the factory, the fire spread quickly, and with no exit left to them, the women climbed through the windows and leapt to their death. While some union members walked in the vigil, others took buses to a Brooklyn cemetery where seven unidentified Triangle victims lie buried. Union members paid their respects and read the stone marker above the women's graves. In sympathy and sorrow, citizens of New York raised this, this monument, monument over, over the grave of unidentified women and children who, with 139 others, others perished, by perished by fire in the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, Washington Place, March 25th, 1911. I produced that piece with journalist Kathy Doby. Well, Francis Perkins happened to be just blocks away when the fire broke out. In 1964, she recalled watching the workers jump to their deaths.